I uh, work for BCM, which is Baptist Collegiate Ministries. I work at Tulsa Community College. I'm there uh, every week. My job is to love on college students and whatever that looks like for Tulsa Community College. And so, some of you go there, and if you don't, I, I don't care that you don't go there. I'm still, I'm still around to love on people that are college age. Some people, you know, you don't have to go to college. Uh, but pretty much our, our ministry is for people 18 to 24, we bump that to 26 whenever it's convenient for us. And you know, we don't, we don't discriminate on what college you go to. We, we got people from NSU, we got people from, people come back, we've got one student who comes back from Rose State every Thursday because it's been so we can back and post that day. Our job is to love people. Um, that's what we do there, and connect people with community. And we never want to compete with all of that. We love what you guys have going on here. Um, and so we do our stuff on Thursday night. You guys do your stuff on Tuesday night. So if you're looking for something to do on Thursday night, Southeast Campus, 7 o'clock, come join us for worship. Come come afterwards and join us for Buffalo Wild Wings. Um, but as I said, I'm Ryan Cole. I recently just moved to Tulsa uh, a year ago to start my job here. I went to a seminary out in California and moved back to this job. I met my wife out there. And uh, just recently, three months ago, I had this little guy. His name's Lincoln. You can all awe now. That's what your job is supposed to do. Aw. Yes. When you see baby pictures, you're supposed to awe. Doesn't matter if they're ugly or not. You always have to cut the parent a break and just say, oh, how cute. And then you look, and then you look at the person next to you and like, um, And so I was wondering what people did with ugly babies. Because it's like, do you know your kid's ugly? Or do your parent blinders blind you? So I think my kid's cute. People have told me he's cute. I hope they're not going to lie to me. Um, but I would probably lie to someone if they're baby. <laughs> All right, tonight we're going to be in uh, Second James, or not Second James, James two. Let's go with that. Yeah, if your uh, Bible's missing Second James, then we need to have a talk. Uh, James two. We're going to be starting in verse uh, fourteen tonight. I'll give you a chance to find it, and then uh, we'll start working through it. All right, James fourteen um, through twenty six. What good is it? To get my words right. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, "Go in peace, be warm, be warmed and filled," without giving them the things they need for their body, what good is that? So also. Faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, and you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in that same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when he received the messengers that sent, and sent them out by another way. For the party, for the body, apart from the spirit is dead, and faith apart from the works is dead. That's a great person. God, I thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here tonight. I pray that your message would be brought this evening, God, and I pray that your word would be honored and glorified and that you would share your wisdom with us. Jesus, amen. So I want to go to verse 14, because every time I read this passage, it's always this, like, first gotcha, because one of the most important things we're taught, I feel as Christians, especially people who uh, are raised in Southern Baptist Church, we have, like, this, like, wait moment, what just happened? Verse 14, what good is it, my brothers, if anyone says he has faith but does not have works? Can his faith save him? And I've always been taught that we are saved by faith. And so sometimes when I read this passage, I have this moment of like, wait, yes? What? I'm confused. 
Romans 2.13 says, For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law that will be justified. And so, at certain parts of my life, I've had these struggles of, are we not saved by faith alone? Like, wait a second. This is what I've always been taught. This is what I've been raised on. And now I read this passage that's talking about works, works, works. So do we have it right? Or do we not? Like, what, what's going on with all of this works now that people, that, that James is bringing out right here? And so let's look. Um, if you have uh, your Bibles, we're going to go to Ephesians real quick. We're going to be in a lot of different places tonight. All the scripture is going to be up on the uh, screen if you can't go to it. We're going to be in Ephesians 2 8. We're just going to look at this section right here. Ephesians 2, starting in verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. So again, we're back to faith saves me. And this was not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of your works, uh, so that no man may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works. Now we're back to works. Where do works and faith go here? Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we're going back and forth on this idea of why is there this need for works that all of a sudden is being brought out by James for part of our salvation. Because normally I've always been taught that it's grace by faith alone. And I want to challenge you guys. Let's look through, like, what does that mean? If, if works are part of our salvation, if works is something that we have to do, I know you guys are giving me questioning looks, don't worry, we're going to come around back to it. Some people are like, what? Heresy is this guy about tonight? Who did Riley get up here? Like, what is about to happen? Is he about to break out the Book of Mormon on us? No, it's all going to come back around. So calm down for a second. I'm getting some scared faces. <laughs> but we come to this idea of James is bringing out this heavy message of, like, works. And it's written all throughout the New Testament. We like to ignore it sometimes because we're just like, oh, no, it's, a, it's grace by faith alone. So I have my faith. I am secure in that. But there's this heavy undertone, I mean, it's not even an undertone, it's more of an overtone of, like, the works that are supposed to be going on, though. So it's this weird thing of, like, if, if, it's, not by, if it's not by works, then why is works brought up so much? Why is there such this need for works? And verse 18, let's go back to James 2, 18 through 20. And he talks about this. But some will say, you have faith, and I have works. So I say to you, show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, and you do well. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Do you want, do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is, is useless? And so I struggle with this idea. And it really kind of worked on me over my life of, I think what James is talking about here is that they're going on in this passage, what James is talking about is there's a difference between knowledge and understanding. And that's something that we've missed a lot in today's context. Because thanks to the power of the internet, I can know the answer to any question. But do I understand the answer to that question? And so we're going to have a little math quiz right now to illustrate this point. So we have a first math question. What is the absolute value of 6? Six? Six. 6. What is the absolute value of negative 6? Six? Six. Why? What does the absolute value mean? But, like, but what does it actually mean? It's positive, but like, what does it mean? Um, it's the same number plus. <laughs> okay, so, so you know it, but you don't understand it. Let's go on to the next question. What is the Pythagorean's theorem? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. What does that mean? It means that the square root of one side of the right triangle plus the square root of another side is the equivalent of the square root. Boom. Okay, so we understand that question. Last question. Last question. Uh, our third question is, is 
the harder one of the night. What is an imaginary number or a complex number? It's an I? Okay, that's how we represent it. What does it mean? Imaginary Square root of negative one. Square root of negative one. And why is it considered imaginary or complex? Because we kind of can't do it. It doesn't work. Because what number times itself equals a negative number? It doesn't work. It breaks math. So we just call it imaginary and we ignore it. But, so we, so we, because the scientists back in 1970 needed to work way to do complex math problems, so they made up the imaginary number. So like, so my, my undergrad, uh, I should, I'll, let, I'll leave this part out, but I'm a raging nerd. So my undergrad is actually math. Like not a, not like a math education, not like applied statistics, but I'm talking pure, unaffiliated math with reality. There gets the point, you know, you always ask that question in class when you're in high school. Like, what, when do I ever actually use this? What's the application of this? And when you get so far along the degree path that I went to, if you ask that question, they say there is no application. This equation just proves math works. And if this equation didn't work, math wouldn't work. It's real fun. <laughs> and so, I'll answer, I can give you in-depth explanations for all these math quizzes. But later, if you want them, I'm sure none of you do. But to me, it's fun. Um, but it's this idea that we can know how to do something. We can know the answer. You know what the absolute value is. You have no idea why. And you know, like, kind of like, oh, it's the square root of negative one, so it can't, you know, it's, it's just what it is. But like, why do we do it? What does it all mean? And so I want to keep looking back at James right here now. Let's go to James. Uh, Verse 20 through 24. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and that faith was completed by his works, and that scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. And in the same way also, in verse 25, in the same way also Rahab the prostitute was justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them on their, out by another way. So James brings up two references. He's like to illustrate my point. is this idea of that faith that does something. Faith of works. He brings up two figures. And these two figures are super relevant for why they were chosen. We have Abraham on one side. Who is Abraham? The father of Judaism. The father of Judaism, the father of Israel, the father of everything they're doing. And James, this book is written to Jews. So when he brings up Abraham, it's like, you guys know who I'm talking about. He's kind of a big deal. Like, this would be referencing someone we all hold in high regard. So he's, he's going to the highest person and saying, he was accounted righteous for his faith, but then that caused him to take part in something, and then we see Rahab. Who's Rahab? Prostitute. Prostitute. Not even a Jew. He's holding up the greatest Jew to some prostitute, and he's showing some, he's showing that they have the same faith. And on some level, that's, a, that's pretty controversial to the people that he's bringing this message to. He's like, listen, these same two people are considered the same level of righteousness. In Judaism, that would be unheard of. But he's saying that our new faith, this faith that if we understand it, it has ramifications. And to talk about what, to bring up this point with Abraham, let's go to if you have your Bibles, Genesis 15. We're going to go exactly where Abraham is referenced right here. Genesis 15. All right. Because this is where Abraham gets referenced. After these things, the Lord, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Fear not, Abraham. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abraham said, O oh Lord, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham 
said, Behold, you have given me no offspring and no member of my household to be my heir. Oh, wait, I'll stop for a second. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir, for your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward the heavens and the number of the stars, if you are able uh, look toward the heaven and number, and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, the sacrifice of Isaac is not for seven more chapters. That's not until Genesis 22. So we see again that faith is making people righteous. But there are works. Where, but if you looked in Genesis 22, verse 12, at the end of the sacrifice of Isaac, God declares, like right now it's just the narrator is saying he was counted as righteous. But in Genesis 22, it's the Lord recognizes his righteousness. It's a, it's a declarative statement. And I want to just, I want to cover this with Rahab again. Um, what's going on here. So Rahab in Joshua 2, 8 through 13. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and to the men, she said this. All right, so in case you're all wondering what Rahab's story is, in case you forgot your Sunday school Bible lessons. The Jewish people have sent spies into a city to try to figure out how to take down the city. And if they get found out, what do you do with spies? You murder every single one of them. And so Rahab, the prostitute, approaches these spies, figures out who they are, which they can't be very good spies if some prostitute just picked them out. I mean, it's probably going to go bad for them. So Rahab approaches them and says this, I know the Lord has given you the land, and that the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of this land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord, what the Lord, how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea, before when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond Jordan, to Sino and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And, soon, and as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, for there was no spirit left in, the, in man because of you. The Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord, that as I have dealt kindly with you, you will also deal kindly with my father's house, and give me a sure sign that you will that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. Rahab is the perfect illustration of the one point I want to make to you tonight: the difference between knowledge and understanding. Every, who's Rahab say knows about the coming of the Israelites and their God? Everyone. And what does everyone do? They try to kill the Israelites, they try to fight back. And Rahab understands the consequences of what are about to happen. And it causes in her an immediate response to do something. Because I believe that when we grasp fully the realness of the Bible, the realness of Jesus, the realness of the gospel. We no longer have, if we truly understand it, your reaction is to do something. When James is going on and on about this idea of faith without works is dead, what he's talking about is that if you truly understood what the Bible said, you couldn't help but respond in some way. It would fundamentally change you. It would affect you to all of a sudden be realizing that this Jesus guy was the Son of God. And he asked things of me, and I understand this salvation message. I should do what he asked me to do. I should respond in such a way that it would be obvious. And so... Who James is talking to is these Jews who some have been interested in this new uh, Christianity thing that's taken off. Some of them who have been Jews their whole life. Some of them who have just come to faith 
but then they're continuing their Judaism as if like, okay, so Jesus was the Messiah, all right, and I'm still gonna do what I'm doing. It's like, no, if you truly get it, if you truly understand who this Jesus guy was, then you would no longer be trapped in knowledge, but you would have a full understanding and you would respond to that. I'm challenged by that daily because I got to spend the last five years of my life in California before I came here. I went out there for seminary, and San Francisco is a fun place, let me tell you guys. There's a lot of fun people there who do some really weird things. Like, you get really used to the weirdness. And uh, there's, this, there's this thing I really loved about Californians. And that was, if you ask them anything about Jesus, faith, um, what they thought about spiritual things, most of them would tell you, I don't believe in that Bible crap, I don't have time for that. And that is very refreshing to me. Because I know exactly where I stand with those people from the moment the conversation begins. The problem that we have in Oklahoma is that most everybody's been to church on Sunday. Everybody knows the right answers. Everyone has knowledge of the Bible. And like, if I were to go to CCC and I was offered up a quiz of like basic Bible stories, I'm pretty sure 80% of the campus would do very well with no study prep on But they still live sinful lives. They still live with sin constantly destroying them. And they do horrible things. We all do horrible things. And it's because they don't understand it. It's because we, I feel, sometimes fall short in that we don't understand it. One of my favorite verses that challenges me daily is earlier on in James, where it says, pure religion pure religion in the eyes of the Lord. I've always, this, this verse always catches me off guard. Because it's like, do you want to know what perfect religion looks like? James is going to tell you what it looks like. It's the care for the poor and the needy, the orphans and the widows. And to love your neighbor. And it's always caught me off guard. Because I'm just like, people want to know like what it means to like live the perfect life. And what's perfect religion. And it's written in the Bible. Like if you want to do it, just you want just pure religion. Here's what you do. And I think we never do that. I mean, some churches have ministries to the homeless, and some ministries have you know outreach to widows and orphans. But like, how often do we love the world around us? Do we understand the gospel? Because if we understand it, shouldn't our natural response be to do something? Shouldn't our natural response be works of faith and love to the people in the world around us? And I'm challenged by that because I see myself fail every single day. One of the most common failures I do is when I go to Reasons to buy stuff at Walmart. I like do my best to avoid the cashier. I want the self-checkout line. Like, I don't want to stand in line for 10 minutes. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll just do it myself. It's no big deal. But every time you go through a checkout line, you have the opportunity to talk to a person and love on them and just be nice about their day. One of the most profound um, just encounters I've ever had in my life, I was suffering with depression, and I was working at my silly retail job at Pottery Barn, and uh, checking some guy out, he said, you have a nice day. You know, as, as you say to every single customer, if you've ever had a retail job, and you never mean it. You're just, you know, it's part of the thing, like, how was your visit? Is there anything else you need? Here's your receipt, have a nice day. And this guy said something back to me. He said, you know, his response to have a nice day was not, oh, you too, which is what i so used to, I don't even listen to it anymore. He looked at me and said, it won't be for lack of trying. And he walked off, and I, I went home, with my super depressed mind and like pondered that statement for like an hour. It won't be for lack of trying. I don't know if that guy was a Christian. I don't know if that's just the way God chose to spoke to me. But it like profoundly shook me for like a day. Like he's gonna have a good day because he's gonna try to have one. I never thought about that. I should try to have a good day. It pissed off my best friend.
that she was just like, that's all we had to say to you? And I think, like, that guy's just giving me, like, maybe what he thinks is a catchy slogan, but we should be sharing with people the love of God. That's what we should be sharing with the cash here. And maybe that doesn't mean you attack them with the gospel presentation every time you're standing in line, but maybe that's like, how is your day? And they're like, that's fine. You don't ignore that, and you follow it up with a question. It's like, no, tell me what's going on in your life. Can I pray for you? How could I pray for you if I could? And let me tell you, cashiers are almost numb to the people that walk by them daily. When someone gives them attention, they eat it up. It says that they will know we are Christians by our love for one another. And how are we loving people? What is our response? Are we like the people in the beginning of this passage who come to our dinner table, come to our potluck that you're having a little while, and sit around and are just like, man, we have awesome food, we have awesome people, we're doing great. And someone walks in and, you know, it's just like barely getting by. You know, it's like, I don't have enough to eat, you know? And so, yeah, they're going to take, you know, two plates full, but like, we should see that. And our response shouldn't be just like, oh man, it sucks to be them. I'll pray for you, buddy. Hope your life gets better. It should be like, hey man, here's all the leftovers. Like, let me give you top of work for that. Like, too often, we've taken this hands-off approach of God will save them, of God will help them. And we think that we're really spiritual when we have that answer. We think that we're really spiritual when we're like, oh no, God will save the people. God will share his love. He will share his life. How does he do that? He picks 12 bums, which are like fishermen, a tax collector no one liked, some weird people, a guy who even betrayed him. And he picked those 12 people to be the cornerstone of the church. And he taught them to love people. He taught them to go out. And when they understood it, when they finally got it, they had to be killed to be stopped. And so I want to challenge you guys tonight. This is my only like point. Is your faith knowledge or is it understanding? I don't want to challenge you guys to not just be like, oh, it's a good question, and go home and forget about it. I would love for you to just lay in your bed tonight or wake up tomorrow morning for your quiet time whenever you do it and just ponder on the idea of, do I really understand my faith? Because it's really easy to show up to church every single week. And you guys are awesome for coming on the night that you knew that half the week was going to be gone. But I want to ask you, Ty, how, what does understanding my faith mean? What does understanding the fullness of the gospel? What would that mean if I, to people who don't get it? The, the hypocrites of the church. I think that's what church is. That's what faith is. And too many people think that it's all about judgment and all about who's good and who's bad. But the true understanding is that we've all fallen short. And the true understanding is that our response in all things is to love our neighbor and to love the people around us. And so I just, I don't know, everywhere I go I want to share this message because it always challenges me. Because sometimes I see myself get wrapped up in my day-to-day own idea of like, you know, I'm just I'm going to work, I'm doing what I need to do, I'm going to the grocery store, I'm going home with my family. And, you know, and we, we can, we're really good as people of rationalizing everything we want to rationalize. So I say, I mean, I love the crap out of my family, that's what God wants for me. But how am I loving my neighbors that I actively avoid? I just found out this week that the neighbor who lives below me as the dog that my wife hates because he barks all the time. He's actually a youth minister at a church nearby our house. I've lived by this guy for a year. I've said hi to him twice, and that's only because we were getting out of our cars at the same time. Like, I've actively avoided this guy who could be a good friend and a good resource and a good ministry partner because I haven't loved on my neighbors, which is exactly if I understood the full ramifications of the Bible, if I understood that who does God tell you to love? Your neighbor. It's like, it broke my heart to know this. And so I want to challenge you guys for this week 
as you go out. When you read your Bible, when you read anything spiritual, don't seek knowledge. Seek understanding. And you guys are so blessed to have the internet, which is also a curse. But you can dig into anything. We have such a blessing in that almost all of human knowledge is somewhere on that thing, if you can find it. And if you want to look for commentaries online, there are commentaries online which are filled with people who are real old and have read the Bible way longer than you have, who have written their full knowledge on there that you can just consume. That's a resource that people just decades ago would have died for. And so I want to challenge you guys this week. Do you understand the gospel? Is it not just faith of knowledge that you know quite well and you can say all the verses, but understand and understand the ramifications of it. To love people, to encounter people. That's what I have for you tonight. So I want to pray for you guys. And we're just going to spend some time in prayer that God would convict us to help us understand where we fail to understand what we're doing right and how we can love people better. And then after that, I'm pretty sure we're done. So, God, I thank you so much for how you love us. I thank you for your continued love and mercy that you give us. God, I pray that you would help us as people who show up to church of our own volition, God, on a Tuesday night. God, and while we, we know the stories, we know the moment the pastor or preacher starts giving us the reference to the scripture, we know exactly where a sermon's going. We know exactly what the lessons and points are going to be. God, we've heard it all before. God, at some point, it becomes stale to us we're not careful. And God, I pray that you would, you would break our hearts with that coldness and hardness. I pray that you would help us as Rahab be sitting amongst a group of people who all know what's about to happen and are just afraid of it, terrified of it, ignoring it. And like Rahab, just to respond to it in a way that saves our families, saves those that we care about, God, but just radically changes us. God, I pray that you would help us truly understand your love for this world. Just give us a glimpse on it, God. Give us a glimpse. Wrap us up in the understanding of what your love truly means in such a way that people can't shut us up. That we will love people that you put around us, God. That we will no longer ignore the people whose response to how they're doing is fine as they but God, to like dig into their lives and show them love. God, I thank you so much for how you show continued compassion on me when I do not deserve it. And I pray that you would help me to show that compassion to the people that I encounter in our lives. God, I pray that you would just help us continue as we go out tonight, as we go throughout our week, and help us to love. Help us to not put our headphones in and ignore the people around us. And help us to look around and head up and smile and engage the world for you. We would understand what you have for. Jesus, thank you. Amen.